Titus chapter 2 in your Bibles, please. And we'll begin reading here in, uh, let's see, we'll start verse number 11. And uh, read just a few verses here in uh, Titus chapter 2, beginning verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These are tremendous verses. Let's pray, and we'll get right into the lesson for today. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your, in your house today. Thank you for these in our Sunday school class. I pray you bless us as we study this morning, as we look again at this subject of grace, how important it is. I pray you help us be the pastor as he teaches, and then, of course, when he preaches in just a little while in the morning service. We thank you this morning that we have the opportunity to serve you and to worship you. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. These verses are incredible verses. I'll review just a little bit. We talked about there in verse number 11, uh, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation. We talked about salvation comes by grace. Remember what we said, grace is unmerited favor. It means God gives us what we need but do not deserve. We do not deserve eternal life. We do not deserve heaven. We don't deserve salvation. But because God loves us and is gracious, he gives that to us. We talked about that in the first week. That salvation is by faith through grace. Or by grace through faith, and it's it's the only way to get salvation is by grace, because um, you can't earn it, you can't work for it, you can't buy it. And then we talked about that. Uh, next of all, the lessons that it teaches us. Grace does more than save us; it teaches us. And uh, we looked at that how it teaches us uh, to deny ungodliness. And so, ungodliness are those things that are against God. How many of you saw some things this week, and maybe the society, maybe people where you work, that are against God? Oh, yeah, it's everywhere. Uh, if you turned on any television, you saw it, because it is against God. Uh, and, and, you know, just most of the public dialogue in America is against God. It absolutely is. And uh, I was reading some things uh, yesterday. I mean, I wish I had a quote with me. Um, Benjamin Franklin, who was not a believer, he was not saved, uh, he, he, but he did have respect to the Bible, and he believed in God, but he, as far as we know, he never trusted Christ as his Savior. He loved to hear uh, George Whitfield preach. That was his favorite preacher, the, great, the preacher that sparked the Great Awakening. But he made a comment when they were writing the, the Constitution for the United States, and they, they couldn't get, they couldn't agree on anything. They were fighting, and, and uh, they were there in Philadelphia. They were, they were working through all that. And, uh, you know, first we had the Articles of Confederation. Then came the, the, de the uh, Constitution. And he stopped them, and, and, and I wish he could give you the whole quote, but he made the comment that, you know, we've been fighting against one another. He said, it is evident that America is here because of the divine province of God. And he went on to say that, that, uh, that, that God works in the affairs of men. Grace teaches us that. And, uh, and so, man, I could get off on that, and I can't. We've got to move on. And, and then we said denying ungodliness, then denying worldly lust. Those are those appetites of our flesh that tells us to do what we want to do, even though the Bible's against it. How many of you ever noticed you have problems with that? Yeah, we all do. You know? And so we're to deny that grace teaches us how to get past that. Then last week, the, the last thing that we talked about, that we should live soberly, uh, meaning having every temper, appetite, desire under the, the, the control of the Spirit of God. We're to be temperate, meaning control. Self-control is really spirit control. You and I cannot do what we ought to do on our own. It's not... It's not um, you know, our own self-will. We can't decide we're going to do that. We must have the help of God. We look there in those scriptures in Romans chapter 7 where Paul talked about the things that I would do, I don't, things I don't want to do, that's what I do. And we've all experienced that. That's because of our flesh, what it does and how it controls us. And so this morning, 
We're going we're gonna to step into this next area where the Bible says that the grace, it, you look there again in verse number uh, 2, or 12, excuse me, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. All right, the grace teaches us that we're to live righteously. And righteously literally means to be right in the sight of God all the time. How many of us do that? Yeah, none of us. <laughs> but we're supposed to live righteously. Um, as you see there, the, the quote in there, rendering to every man his due, injuring no person in his body, mind, reputation, or property, doing unto all as we would have them do unto us, filling up uh, the duties of the particular stations in which it has pleased God to fix us, committing no sin, omitting no duty. So, the Bible is telling us that we are to live righteously. This is growing in grace, where we learn to live rightly. We do the right things. Um, I think we looked at this passage last week, but if you'll take your Bibles, and uh, let's go to Psalm 1. Psalm 1 in your Bibles. Psalm 1. And notice in verse number 1, the Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So here the Bible is teaching us that we're to walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. What does that mean? It means we don't we don't we don't fellowship. Uh, we don't you know if you if you tell somebody hey let's you know walk with me. What does that mean? You're going to go somewhere and you're going to communicate with one another, right? And, and we're not supposed to communicate like that to fellowship with people that are ungodly, people that are against God. Uh, then we're not to stand in the way of sinners. Notice the progression. You're walking, then what happens? You stop walking and you just stand in there. Standing and talking. Does that make sense? Uh, it said we're not to stand in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. When you start hanging around the ungodly, listening to their counsel, listening to what they say, you see the world all the time uh, on, uh, on all these different um, talk shows. By the way, don't, talk, don't listen to any of those. Uh, I heard that the view is going to go off the air. I am so glad. Yeah. Uh -huh. That is the most worthless thing on television. I'm glad. All right? I don't watch it at all, but it is wicked. Those people on there are absolutely wicked. They're against God. The advice they give is against God. All right? Can we, we just, we'll keep quiet and talk you down. All right? That's okay. It's okay. And, and so um, the things that are against God, we're not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. That's why we don't go to lost people for advice. You want financial advice, don't go to somebody who's not saved and in a local church tithing and serving God. Because the first thing they're going to tell you is don't tithe. Mm -hmm. The very first thing they're going to tell you. And God says, you do that, I can't bless you. So, you know, you got to be careful where you get your, your counsel. Say, uh, walk not in the counsel of God, nor stand <laughs> in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. When you're around the ungodly, and then you're standing there communicating and fellowshipping with people that are their lives are consumed by sin. Before long, you're going to be scornful. What's scornful? Mocking the things of God. That's where you'll end up. And, and I see it all the time. Uh, young people that, man, they grew up in church and they used to serve the Lord. Their parents served the Lord. And they get away from that. In just a few years, they're now people that are mocking the things of God, mocking the beliefs that their parents had. Why? Because they walked with sinners. Uh, they, or, I'm sorry, they, they stood with sinners and they walked with the ungodly. And so we're not to sit in the seat of the scornful. But you notice the, the, the verse number two, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. What's the key? The word of God. If we're going to live righteously. We have to be in God's book. Look at verse six of that chapter. Psalm one, verse six. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So the, what the world has is going to, it's, it's just going to lead to destruction. But when we follow the path of the Lord, we will have, uh, we'll have his blessing. Uh, you're there in Psalm, go to Psalm 37. 
What an amazing chapter. Psalm 37. There's so much we can look at Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Brother William, can you make a note to, for us for next Sunday to have some extra Bibles in this classroom? Extra Bibles? Yeah. I have Bibles at the bottom. Yeah, that's okay. Just we should have them in here. And I, I thought about that last week and I forgot to do that. Psalm 37. Uh, man, there's so much in this chapter. We'll look at verse number 3. We'll start there. Psalm 37 and verse number 3. Well, the Bible says, Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land. And verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. So here, the, the Bible is clearly teaching us we're supposed to be trusting in God. We're supposed to be delighting in his way, the way he wants things done. <clears throat> and then if you'll take uh, turn over to the next page, Psalm 37, <clears throat> look at verse number 21. I'm sorry, yes, yeah, verse 21. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth, mer showeth mercy uh, and giveth. For such as are uh, sh such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they shall not uh, they shall be cursed of him. Uh, sh they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him. With his hand. So here the Bible is very clearly teaching us I'm supposed to submit what my way unto the Lord. It says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Now there's two ways to look at that. For the Lord, that means he's the one that structures them, order. And God is a God of order, by the way. Amen. And you start Genesis 1, creation was done in order. It's very specific. God is that way. God doesn't just wing it out there. I've heard somebody say, well, you know, God just created all the matter and then evolution took over. No, that's not my God. Mm -hmm. He's the one that paints every rainbow. He paints every sunset. He's very detailed in what he does. If you've ever looked at, you know, the detail of what the, fe what the wings of a butterfly look like, man, they are just beautifully painted. No artist can come close to what God does on a daily basis. And so it's, it's the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He's their they're directed, they're, they're put together, but also they're ordered. Like if you're in the military and you're ordered, you're commanded. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The problem is we don't like that part. <laughs> How many of you like to be told what to do? Yeah, yeah. yeah, you don't like to be told what to do. None of us do. We all want to do it our own way. Amen. And that's our problem. And, uh, and so um, here the Bible says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way, though he fall. He shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Look at verse number 30. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. So we're talking about how the grace teaches me to live righteously. You know, there ought to be a difference in how a child of God behaves. People ought to be able to watch you at work or in your neighborhood and know you're not like everybody else. You shouldn't dress like them. You shouldn't talk like them. Your activities should be different. Um, you know, you shouldn't be seen in the places where the world goes. I'll never forget this. an old story from my family, or from, from my life. But my best friend in high school, uh, Brother Tony, he was, a, a, he was called to preach like I was. And man, we preached together on street corners every Friday night. We handed out tracts at school. In a public school, we took, stood on top of trash cans and preached in between class. While the students were going everywhere, one of us would preach, the other would hand out tracts. And uh, man, Tony was a lot of fun to have around. Uh, one day, Tony had been invited to go to a party for one of the buddies that he'd been witnessing to. And, uh, and Tony decided he was going to go just to try to encourage this guy and try to get him to come to church. So he shows up at this party, a typical high school senior party where there's dancing going on, and there's probably liquor there. Um, I'm not sure about that, but a lot of stuff going on that a believer should not be a part of. Tony walked in, and his friend looked at him and said, Why are you here? I thought you were a Christian. And Tony realized the mistake he'd made. You can't go hang around with them in their activities. You don't go to a bar to witness to people. You're in the wrong place. 
You say man right there. Yeah. Right? Why? Because he was out of place. It took a long time before Tony had the credibility to talk to the guy. He looked at the guy and said, you're right. I shouldn't be here. He turned and left. But the damage had been done. Uh, we need to live righteously, live in a way that when the world looks at us, they realize they don't act like we do. They're different. And uh, as believers, we need to live righteously. Uh, you know, they can, they can criticize all they want about what we believe, but if we live what we believe, they'll look at us and say, well, they're... At least they live what they said. Amen? And, and so we're to live righteously. This week, I want you to think about that as you're, as you're scheduling your activities and you go to your places. Is this a place where I can live righteously? Where I can have a good testimony of the Savior? If people find out you're a believer, would it shock them that you're there? Amen. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a friend of mine. He, he played football for the uh, University of Florida back in the 80s. He was an offensive lineman. He was drafted by the Denver Broncos. And we lived in Denver at the time. And uh, he came to play for the Denver Broncos. His offensive lineman, Billy Henson is his name. And Billy, uh, he joined our church at South Sheridan Baptist Church, a strong independent Baptist church, soul winning church, and started working in the youth ministry. And here he is, a professional football player, offensive lineman. Uh, <clears throat> how many remember the story of the um, against Cleveland, the drive, John Elway, that's when he made his, his mark, you know, that two minutes to go, they're down by a touchdown, all that. He was on the field at the time. I mean, that's who this guy was. He was a great football player and uh, a great Christian. And he, was, he played there, then he got traded uh, to Atlanta, played in Atlanta, and during that time, we had moved to Jacksonville, Florida, and he was from not far from there, and he ended up joining our church there in Florida. So it was good to see both Billy Ken and there he was serving the Lord. He was in our youth ministry and all of that. But he played football. If you're in the NFL, you don't go to church on Sunday. Because you're playing football on Sunday. He was playing for the Atlanta Falcons, was the starting offensive lineman for the Atlanta Falcons. One day he walked into the coach's office and handed him his playbook and said, I can't do this anymore. I said, why? He said, because I'm a Christian. And Christians go to church on Sunday. And I play football on Sunday instead of going to church. And I got to go to church. And he left the NFL so he could be faithful in church. Walked away from uh, his, his salary in those days was like 600000 That's nothing anymore. But in the mid-80s, that was big bucks. By then it was almost the late 80s. And uh, he said, I just can't do this. I need to be in church. If I'm going to be a Christian, I got to be at church. He walked away from He's still serving the Lord today. He's running a, a, a ranch to help people that are in trouble. And just, he's doing a great job. Um, he had a lot of criticism for that. But I'll never forget in our high school, we had, in our church, we had a Christian school. And that year at the high school graduation, one of the seniors stood up. And they were supposed to talk about who their hero was. They said, my hero is Billy Henson. Not because he played football at the University of Florida. Not because he played in the NFL and, went to a Super Bowl, and not because he, he played at Denver and played at Atlanta. He said, he's my hero because he walked away from all that to serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. I wonder, what's your testimony? Is it one of righteousness? The Bible says faith teaches us that we're to live righteously. Then notice what else says, and godly. What is that? That is that which is after God. It follows God. How much of your life is after God? Uh, you look there in your notes, I've got a, a reference, Psalm 63, 8. Psalm 63, 8. Tremendous verse. Uh, if you mark in your Bible, I would recommend you mark this one. Psalm 63 and verse number 8, where David said, My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. What an amazing verse. Here David, king of Israel, says, my soul followeth hard after thee. What does that mean? That means David, his focus was following God. He wanted to live godly. You and I are supposed to live in such a way that it patterns our life after the way God behaves. Uh, the Bible says there in 2 Peter 3, in verse number 18, if you'll want to turn there, 2 Peter, that's in your New Testament. 2 Peter, if you get to the book of Revelation, you went just a little too far back up, you'll see the 
first, second, third John, we'll just back up a little bit more, and you'll get to first and second Peter, second Peter, chapter number three. The Bible says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So we're to grow in grace. When grace teaches us how to live righteously and how to live godly. We're to pattern ourselves after God. It is by grace that God can teach us how to grow as a believer. The grace of God is how we can serve him. I love what the Bible says in Acts 14. I think these re this reference is in your notes. Uh, yes, at the bottom of the page on page 3. Uh, Acts 14, 26. And then sailed to Antioch uh, from whence they had been recommended by the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. This is the story of, of, of uh, Barnabas and Saul on that first missionary journey. And the grace of God did what? It allowed them to accomplish what they were supposed to do for God. When you and I serve the Lord, it's by His grace. And we're recommended to the grace of God for the work that God has us to do. In 1 Corinthians 15, 10, that reference is also there. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. For I had, for yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Now think about this. The Apostle Paul's writing that. He's saying that it's by the grace of God I am what I am. Y'all remember what Paul was before he got saved? What was Paul? He was a murderer. He was a, in fact, go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. One of the things about the Apostle Paul, he never forget what, forgot what he was before he got saved. He realized where God found him when he saved him. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, and look at verse, oh, let's see here. We'll start verse number 11. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 11. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he uh, counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Paul was saying, before I got saved, I was a blasphemer. What's blasphemy? That's when you attribute to Satan the works of God. Remember before he got saved, he didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. He thought that he was doing justice by seeing, you know, Christians being arrested, right? And so he was a blasphemer. He was against the things of God. Uh, he was injurious, or he, I'm sorry, he was a persecutor. He persecuted the church, the Bible says. Uh, in Acts uh, chapter number seven, or eight, Acts chapter eight, Saul was persecuting the church around the time of Stephen, and a multitude of people left Jerusalem and went as far as Antioch because of his persecution. So he was a persecutor and injurious. He was there when Stephen was stoned to death. He held the coats so the guys could throw the rocks. He was a partaker in that. Over and over again, he had Christians uh, arrested and beaten. That's who he was. And he thought he was serving God when he did that. But notice what he said. But I obtained mercy. Because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. Notice verse 14, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul realized what he was. He was a sinner that had been saved. Now look at the rest of that verse. verse I'm sorry, verse 16, the next verse. How be it for this cause... I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Here Paul says, here's why God saved me. He says, for this cause. 
that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should come hereafter. Was he saying, God saved me so that he could make me an example, a trophy, if you will, that if God could save Paul, he could save anybody. And so Paul, when he says there in 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. He said, were, were it not for the grace of God, I'd be burning in hell right now. You know, every one of us can say that. Amen. Amen. It's the grace of God. And then he says, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. And then because of the grace, because of what God saved him from, I labor more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Paul said, the reason I serve God with my whole heart, with every ounce of my being, is because I know what it was when God saved me. If you realize how deep the grace of God is in your life, you'll want to serve God. Not because the preacher said so. Not because you're going to have to fill out a report. No, you serve God because of his grace. It's not that we have to serve God. It's that we get to. I've heard preachers say, oh, i got to preach this morning. Are you kidding me? I get to. It's something I get to do by his grace. I love uh, the song Amazing Grace, uh, How Sweet the Sound. I love this part of the, 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 uh, the song. It says, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. Grace let us realize who God was, and that we stood before Him guilty, worthy of death, worthy of going to hell. Grace my uh, taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Remember when you first got saved, when you realized I'm not going to heaven anymore. Oh, what a wonderful thing. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. His grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Of course, that wonderful song was written by John Newton, a slave trader, a wicked individual. One day, he on a slave ship, and I don't remember the exact details of the story. He was no longer the captain. He now was in the hold with the slaves. He was a prisoner. And during that time, he remembered what his mother had told him about the grace of God and about Jesus Christ. And in that hold of, around a bunch of slaves, he trusted Jesus as his Savior. Became a great pastor, a great preacher, wrote that great song about the grace of God. Amazing grace. We sang that last week here at church. Um, and so it's, it's grace, salvation it brings, the lessons it teaches us. This week, grace will teach you how to serve the Lord. Now, next week, we'll look at uh, this. Week, next week will be our last lesson on um, this subject of grace. And uh, we'll be looking at the hope it sets before us. So take, take the, that paper that you've got there. Look at all of those verses. And we'll talk about a lot of good stuff next week. I'm looking forward to reading again those verses in Titus. We'll look at the ones there in Colossians that you see. And we'll have a good time talking about the second coming tonight. The service, we're singing a bunch of songs about the second coming of Christ. He could come today. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Amen. Go to heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you that we're saved, not because we deserve it or we've earned it, but because of your grace. You loved us, gave us what we needed, but do not deserve. Thank you for the Lord Jesus who died on the cross and was buried and rose again to pay for our sins. I pray you would help us. To learn to live in that grace. Not just get it at salvation, but realize every day your grace is abundant upon us. And because of that, we should live righteously. We should live soberly. We should live godly. In this present world, God, help us to be a great testimony. Help us to serve you with passion this week. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.